Sisters. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ALI Parent Power Hour, where everything is everything. We hope that you are doing well and that your families are healthy and safe and sound. My name is Kalina Berryman, and I'm the director of the Abbott Leadership Institute. And on behalf of ALI staff, the Center for Pre-College Programs, and Rutgers University Newark. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Today's topics are very important to me. Uh, we're gonna be providing updates on changes at the state level to graduation requirements for our high school seniors, who we are keeping in our thoughts because I know it's very hard to lose um, such a significant part of senior year and graduation. But you know we, we have to do what we have to do. And uh, we hope that the news around graduation requirements will help some of our young people to navigate this tra this transition. And we're also going to be talking about changes to special education, which as a special needs parent and going into remote learning and wondering what was gonna happen to my son's therapy services, this topic was very important. So thank you to the Education Law Center for being a part of today's broadcast. My co-host for today is none other than my friend, uh, educational champion and chief public affairs officer of Newark CPAC, one of my favorite organizations, Safir Jenkins. Safir, where are you, my brother? <laughs> hello, 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 Kalina. Hello, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. What a wonderful uh, uh, introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, Absolutely. So Absolutely. Yeah. You're a wonderful family doing wonderful work. Before we get into our topic, how is your family navigating COVID-19 and remote learning and all of those things? Yeah, no, it's a good question. You know, much like every other family uh, who faces similar challenges like we do, um, yeah. you know, we're learning as we go. And my son, fortunately, uh, has modeled the behavior of being able to adopt uh, and be flexible in these times of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're just taking the cue from him and we're following yeah. his lead. So it's working out well. Um, yeah. You know, he's now beginning to appreciate learning online with his class. So. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think as parents, no matter if your child is uh, regular education or special education, the number one thing was that, you know, they adjust well to this transition. My son is loving being at home. <laughs> he is in his glory. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm just glad that he's safe. And before we really get into our topic, we want to first just acknowledge all of those who are um, at a loss, uh, a loss of family or of a job or of income or of safety or anything as a result of COVID-19. We send our thoughts and our prayers and our duas to you. And, you know, we're here as a community. We're going to continue to persevere. And we hope that this conversation adds something to just keeping things as productive as possible and allowing us as parents to be able to advocate for the needs of our children during this time. So without further ado, we're going to get into introducing the staff of the Education Law Center. The Education Law Center is the leading voice in education advocacy in our state. They are responsible for legislative and policy wins that have resulted in equity in school funding, resulted in school construction, the free preschool program, the rights of students with special needs. In fact, ALI's name, Abbott Leadership Institute, comes from the Abbott versus Burke rulings that were championed and won by the Education Law Center. So thank you, ELC, for the inspiration. And what I love most about ELC is that parents and community have always been with them in the fight for educational justice. They have never done it without us. And Stan and, and, and the staff, many people from ELC staff have been at ALI classes. And so it's no surprise to have them with us today. So our first presentation conversation will be from Stan Karp, who is the executive director of the Secondary Education Reform Project who has been advocating for the rights of young people in high school for many years. And he's going to tell us about what's happening to graduation requirements now as a result of Governor Murphy's executive order. Stan Karp, my friend, how are you? So Stan, okay. we can't hear you. Okay. All right, we got you now. Is that better? Yes. Okay, always good to be with ALI. Thanks for having us. Thank you, you were actually with us in the fall 
um, telling us about graduation requirements and standardized testing. And so it's only right that we have you with us today. So Stan, what is going on with high school graduation requirements for students in New Jersey? Break it down. What do parents and students need to know? Well, uh, a lot has changed since November. Mostly uh, we're all you know, sitting in our homes, uh, hoping, hopefully being safe and uh, taking care of our, our loved ones and everybody else in the community. And some of the changes that uh, affect the graduation rules started on March 24th when the uh -huh. uh, um, governor and the commissioner of education announced that they would be canceling state tests this year because of the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, that because schools were closed, because there were so many issues, uh, the regular state tests, which are the New Jersey student learning assessments, which is what they renamed the park tests that we heard about for so many years. Mm -hmm. uh, they were canceling those for 2020 uh, for all grades, three to eight, and also all high school tests. But they were also canceling the access for ELL students and the dynamic learning maps uh, tests given okay. to some special education students. Mm -hmm. But that announcement that they made on March 24th um, actually said they were going to continue with the same graduation requirements, wow. including the testing requirement for graduation, and that for those students who hadn't yet met that testing requirement, <clears throat> excuse me, they were going to have to uh, submit portfolios. Wow. And uh, when ELC heard that uh, announcement, we, we applauded the fact that they were suspending state tests like many states were doing because you know, we thought there were many more pressing issues that staff and students needed to attend to, mm -hmm. but we were concerned that they were continuing the one assessment that many of our most vulnerable uh, seniors in the class of 2020 use. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, about 12,000 students used that to meet the uh, graduation requirement, and that they were also going to try to implement portfolios when the schools were closed when students weren't going to be able to get the kind of support that they would expect to complete. Uh, there were students who, you know, it involved the exchange of materials. And Absolutely. A public health issue. So Stan, can you tell us a little bit more about what the portfolios are? Because we may have some people who aren't familiar. Right. And that actually plays into one of the other uh, concerns we had in addition to the educational and public health uh, issues. There was a legal issue. Mm -hmm. um, many of your listeners may remember that there was a court decision that uh, about it uh, in the end of uh, 2018 that challenged the way the state was using uh, park and some of the other assessments for high school graduation. Yes. And out of that decision, um, it was established that students would have the right to use many multiple pathways to satisfy the <laughs> testing requirement for graduation. Okay. And one and the portfolio was one of those where mm -hmm. students who perhaps didn't get the score they needed on the state test could complete a portfolio of work showing that they had learned the material and that they had satisfied the requirement for an assessment okay. uh, for graduation. Okay, so the portfolio counted as an assessment. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, portfolio has changed over the years. Some of you will remember it used to be called a special review assessment. Then for a while, it was the alternative high school assessment, and then it became the portfolio. Okay. But it was only one of many path pathways. Students could take the SAT. They could get a score on the ACT. Some of them took a military test. Some mm -hmm. of them took ACCUPLACER. All of these were part of the pathways okay. that the court decision established students could use to satisfy the requirement. Okay. Well, one of the problems with the pandemic is that many of those pathways were no longer available. Right, absolutely. The state tests were suspended. The SATs and the ACTs weren't being given. Mm -hmm. um, the um, ACCUPLACER and the uh, military tests, students can't access that from home. And so we were concerned that the only assessment they were continuing was the portfolio, which okay. didn't guarantee the seniors the whole range of choices that they were guaranteed by the uh, consent degree, which is what we signed in an agreement, ELC, ACLU, and the uh, uh, participants who had challenged the regulations. Okay. And so two days after the announcement that they were canceling state tests, but continuing the portfolio and continuing to 
require the testing assessment for graduation, ELC wrote a letter to the governor and to the commissioner mm -hmm. and asked them to reconsider that decision for the public health reasons I mentioned, for the uh, legal reasons connected to the consent degree, and just because it didn't seem fair to us that they were continuing one assessment right. that some of our most vulnerable students needed while they were canceling all the others. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so we got a lot of support for that request. Uh, there were a lot of advocates in Newark, including uh, you know Mimi, who I know is on the call, and the Secondary mm -hmm. Parents Council, including the NAACP, yeah. including the Alliance for Newark Public Schools, Braveheart Schools, New Jersey. There was a lot of support for reconsidering that decision. And I'm happy to be able to say that on April 7th, the governor issued a new executive order in which the requirement for the test for the class of 2020 was suspended. And so seniors in the class of 2020 will be able to uh, graduate as long as they satisfy all the credit requirements, all the other requirements they need for graduation. And it's important that they continue to make sure that they do what's necessary to get those credits. Okay. But those students who hadn't satisfied the uh, testing requirement yet will not have to submit a portfolio. And that requirement has been suspended for the class of 2020. All right. So for right now, what parents and students really need to do is contact their guidance counselors, on Monday immediately and make sure that your students have the credits that they need to graduate. And, not, and, and Stan, do, do credits differ district by district or is there a standard number for the state of New Jersey that's required for graduation? Great question. There is a minimum number of credits that's set by the state. It's 120 credits okay. distributed over certain subjects. But districts can uh, set requirements higher than that. I believe Newark's requirement is 130. Right. Um, and uh, it's, it is important, especially for seniors, but actually for all high school students to check in with their counselors, make sure they're on track to get credit for all the courses they're taking this year. So we don't have any lost years. We don't have any repeating courses, but especially so that seniors are ready for graduation in June. OK, so I'm going to open it up. Um, uh, Safir and I will take any questions. I have Israel here with us helping out. He's going to write down if there are any from our viewers, but I definitely have one question. So some people are saying that because there is no portfolio assessment, because there is no state test, that students in a city like North, for instance, are going to be graduating with a high school degree who really haven't, who really aren't ready or haven't demonstrated that they are ready. What is your answer to that? Well, uh, the first answer is that this year, since there is no way that the state can safely and legally give the graduation assessment that's required, it needs to be suspended. Mm -hmm. Just as you know, both common sense, public health, and equity require that. Absolutely. The larger question you ask is um, that most states uh, do not require a test for a high school diploma. As mm. a matter of fact, New Jersey is one of only about 10 or 11 states that wow. still do. I didn't know that. And there's been a debate about whether or not that requirement should be changed that happened before the pandemic and will continue after the pandemic. Okay. Um, students still need to do everything that all students need to do to graduate in terms of their credits, their attendance requirements, whatever service requirements, they need to complete those. Um, and they need to be in touch with the district and find out, for example, some districts are changing their grading policies in the pandemic going to a pass-fail system. Right. Others are still giving letter grades. It's important that students keep track of that and do what they need to get their credits. But for this year, there is no requirement for a test separate for graduation. Okay. That, that actually uh, leads me into my question, Kalina, if I may, um, because I think there's clearly two sides of that coin, right? Uh, the mode of thought where students are not ready or lack of preparation because they're not taking standardized testing. And before I even get into the question, I do want to mention that, Stan, I certainly consider you an authority uh, in the topic of education here in New Jersey. Uh, obviously, wherever there's a platform that allows for you to uh, stand for education, uh, you're there, and I've seen you at several, so hats off to you for that work. Um, you talked about the pathways to graduation that obviously have been hampered by this pandemic, right? Uh, and then we also talk about how there's one perspective that students lack readiness because of missing testing. Uh, but 
as you mentioned, Stan, there's been ongoing discussions about the necessity of testing and the over-reliance on testing. So how can we ensure equity, right, to those who are most vulnerable to loss of accessibility by driving this permanence of thought that this over-reliance on testing is unnecessary and certainly misplaced? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I, I would hesitate, uh, hasten to point out that all the students who are graduated will have taken many assessments that will be part of their record, that are part of their transcripts. And as someone who was a high school teacher in Patterson for 30 years before I came to ELC, I understand that assessment and testing is a part of schooling, an important part of schooling. What's the debate is whether or not there should be a single assessment that determines whether or not you graduate. And most states and most educators and most research has shown that those uh, assessments don't produce better outcomes for students, don't produce better results in terms of college going or employment. And that's why most states have, um, you know, uh, moved away from them. Uh, there used to be as many as 30 states that did that. And it's down to 11 because we have found that you can't test your way to equity in education. Right. So assessment yeah. needs to be part of it, but it can't be the be all and the, the reason why decisions are made. Yeah. So we did have a question. I'm not sure if Stan can answer this, but it's from um, tax year Cosby Thomas, one of our good ALI friends. She wanted to know if NPS will be giving letter grades or pass fail options for students. Um, I'm not sure, Stan, if you're aware of that answer. No, I'm not. It's a great okay. question and uh, it's important that we get an answer. Yeah, we will definitely get an answer to that. I believe it may have been answered in our uh, follow-up questions to the superintendent. So Tashia will make sure to get an answer to that. Um, Stan, you're not going anywhere, right? No, I'll be here. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Safia. We're going to um, lower Stan for just a bit and we're gonna switch to our next topic, topic which is special education. Thank you, Stan. Yes, thank you very much, Stan. Uh, and thank you, Kalina. Yeah, special education certainly is a topic that requires some emphasis. Uh, we need to place some focus there. Uh, you know, the challenges that we face uh, in general education to this pandemic and the response to it, where students are now relocated to home for learning, uh, is certainly much more trying for students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So it, it gives me pleasure to introduce our next speaker uh, for today because uh, her name is Elizabeth Athos, first of all, also from Education Law Center. She joined the ELC in 1997, and, and before that, she worked as a legal services attorney in New Jersey. Right. She graduated magna cum laude uh, with a bachelor's <laughs> from Mount Hoyloat <laughs> College. Uh, and then she went on to get her Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School. Right. I mean, I don't know what more we could ask for. Uh, in 1990, she was awarded the Ronald B. Atlas Outstanding Attorney Award by Legal Services of New Jersey. And she continued from there in 2014 and she received a CAP Legal Advocate Award from New Jersey Child Assault Prevention. Okay. Elizabeth, it is a great pleasure to introduce you. And from now forward, I'm gonna be quiet and let you speak uh, because <laughs> we need to hear from your voice. Um, so thank you for joining us. There is just one question I'd like to open with um, and really it's around the timing of before and after, how we compare that, you know? Before COVID-19, children with disabilities were not necessarily receiving access to quality and consistency of special education services guaranteed to them by the law. Uh, your work with ELC has been to remedy that. So what were some of the pre-COVID-19 issues that ELC sought to address, particularly here in Newark? The, thank you, by the way, for your introduction. I, I didn't expect that at all, but um, it's really nice to be here. Um, the the uh, biggest issue that, that we had brought litigation about, we had a, have, had a class action lawsuit that addressed actually child find issues, the whole identification and timely evaluation mm -hmm. of students with disabilities. Um, which was a problem going back a, a number of years, but it continued for, for far too long. Um, mm. it, the lawsuit was settled, uh, I think it was six years ago now. There's been monitoring and, and um, it, it really the progress has been very good in the last couple of years. Um, you know, the, the 
um, district has done a remarkably good job at, at improving its its um, timeliness of evaluations. So um, that that was a good thing to see. I mean, there are there are issues with delivery of special education services throughout the state, unfortunately. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the current crisis just uh, it, it, it brings all the inequities to the fore. Um, you know, there's been a dramatic effect on yeah. on special education. Um, it, the um, I, I, I suppose it's, it's good news that in New Jersey, uh, from the start, um, our state said that there had to be equitable access to instruction for all kids in in the school closure plans that were required. Right. Um, State uh, school districts were all required to address appropriate special education and related services, and um, and also things like like uh, nutrition, school meals for students. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that were included, um, you know, would be important. I've done an Oprah request to get all the school district closure plans, and it keeps getting oh, wow. I haven't received the responses yet, but mm -hmm. some some districts put them on their website. Um, I actually, I, I don't know whether Newark has done that, but it, it's worth finding out what is in there, the Newark plan. Um, you know, to just to be sure we're all on the same page here, what I'm about to talk about is um, the, the rights under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the federal special education law. And, um, you know, that, that law guarantees a right to, to a free, appropriate public education which is called FAPE for students with disabilities. Um, and, and that FAPE standard, you know, has been interpreted by courts. It has to be an appropriately ambitious program. It has to have result in meaning, you know, it has to be designed to, to produce um, meaningful progress for students with disabilities. And as best we know, um, right now, that standard is in effect. Um, you know, there, there can still be changes that happen on level, the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, has till April 26 to make recommendations to Congress to waive any requirements of IDEA, um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, there have been, uh, ELC and a number of organizations have um, opposed any waivers, and, and we will do so again if, in fact, she recommends to Congress that that happen. You know, we'll take up advocacy with Congress at, at that point. So, you know, that's, that's a bit of a wild card that's out there that we don't know what's going to happen. But uh, in the meantime, the, um, you know, the United States Department of Education has said if you're serving other students, you have to provide faith for your students with disabilities. And um, you can do that remotely. You can, you can um, do it by providing some, um, distance, I think they refer to it as, as distance learning provided virtually, online, or, or telephonic, mm -hmm. is what the guidance said. So April 1st, New Jersey um, adopted regulations that um, allow, actually they require special ed and related services to be, to be provided. Um, it says through electronic communications, virtual or other online platforms as appropriate and as required by the students IEP. Okay. Um, you know, and that includes you know, what, what has been called um, telepractice where, mm -hmm. you know, a student may receive related services from a certified therapist who's in a different location and the services are coming through the computer screen. <laughs> I had my first uh, session, Elizabeth. We had our first physical therapy session through the computer. Yeah, and it, and was did it, it was honestly, it was wonderful. I said because it empowered me as a parent, right? To know what to do with my son, so it was really good. I, 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 I was happy with it. Yeah, yeah. No, that is a positive benefit that parents can actually watch the the services and and learn how to do carryover. Yeah, um, which is great. So. Yeah, those regulations were changed. Um, actually, two days ago, Governor Murphy also signed a, a bill that um, the, the primary purpose was to make sure that that um, school districts can meet the 180 day requirement um, by providing um, virtual education. But it, that bill also specifically um, it said speech language counseling, physical therapy, occupational therapy and behavioral services. Um, 
can all be provided um, electronically. And um, actually, the new law says they may be provided, but the regulations say shall. So, um, you know, school districts should be starting to do it. If um, you know, especially now, spring breaks are ending, and um, hopefully, they've gotten geared up. You know, there, there are two problems, of course, <laughs> with serving kids remotely, and one is whether they have the internet access and the device. I mean, you know, you need a device for every student you have in your household, and you know, either whether it's a computer or iPad and Chromebook. Yeah. And I, you know, a lot of people aren't in that situation, don't have that. Um, I, I know there have been stories about districts handing out Chromebooks, um, setting up Wi-Fi hotspots. I, I don't know what's happening in Newark. I would, I'd love to get feedback to, um, you know, whether, whether that's happening here. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I had heard a, a disturbing figure that, that as many as 40% of Newark students haven't yet logged online. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I don't know for sure that that's accurate, but it's something I want to follow up on. And, and um, yeah. it, is it true? And what, you know, what's being done about it? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and then of course, the other problem with remote instruction is just not appropriate for all students. I mean, if right. you have serious behavioral or attention or communication issues, um, you know, there, there are various disabilities that may be so severe that, that a student um, just, just can't access, it, um, can't benefit without having direct in-person instruction. Um, so, you know, what, what the federal government has said is, is that there's going to be an individualized determination about compensatory services. You know, school districts may have to make up services to wow. students with disabilities. Um, you know, that there, there are a lot of unanswered questions about, about that and what the scope of it is going to be. I would think that, you know, for a student who got no services at all or a student who, um, you know, regress their skills, regress. Um, that you know, there's a very good argument that they should get additional services when school reopens. So, Elizabeth, that's a, a very good point that you're making there. Uh, certainly, because the permission, uh, as well as the guidance to provide these services virtually, may work for some students, but will not work the same for every student. Right. And so, there will be an equity issue, an accessibility issue. So what do you recommend that parents do if they do have to face the need for individual determination for compensatory services? Yeah, so, um, I mean, first of all, as an interim, I mean, you know, the, the right to individualized determinations for services, it applies, uh, it still applies all along. You still have that right, um, you know, and you, a, a child with a disability shouldn't be just getting a blanket one size fits all if that doesn't fit for them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, on the on the one hand, you know, the, we're, we're not suggesting that IEPs be, be changed. I mean, the IEP mm -hmm. that in effect when the when the student, um, when school closed should be the IEP that's in effect yes. when they return to school. But, um, and this hasn't been routine, but advocates have been recommending what's been referred to as distance learning plans, that you have a plan to try and, see how, how most appropriately to provide the services required by the IEP. But to the extent you can't, um, you know, on the one hand, I would say parents should, should try and document where their kids at, are at, whether it's like taking a videotape of this is what their skill level is. Yeah. And then as time goes on, you know, you have the before and the after. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's hard. It's going to be hard to, to see, and well, I don't know. First of all, hopefully the compensatory services issue will be dealt with through some policy means. Um, right. So that it's not just every person having to fight for their own. Um, you, you know, I would I would hope that that um, there's going to be a recognition that it has to be provided. Um, yeah. I don't. <laughs> it's. Um, I, we're still sort of a long way to, to getting there, I think. Um, yeah. But, you know, parents do, so they, they can still access dispute resolution. The uh, Depart the uh, Office of Administration, Administrative Law is doing um, compensatory, uh, sorry, 
We're doing mediation conferences and due process hearings um, via Zoom and telephone. Right. So it's all moving kind of slowly, and I think everyone is encouraging parents to be flexible and creative and trying to. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I think the most important thing out of that is that parents know that they have the right to remote services. That's number one, because a lot of parents probably don't even know that. They have the right to ask for that, to contact the social worker or the IEP team, the principal, and demand that happen. That is something that parents can do. And second is that keep an eye out for those compensatory services that may be available. At the very um, student to parent level, those two things are transformative, and we need to know about that. I think that um, Work CPAC is probably going to, to be talking about advocacy at the city level around, you know, how many students are actually utilizing those services. My son goes to a school for children with just special needs. So it's easier, I think, to make that happen because the only way they can deliver education is through the remote learning and the, the those services. It's such a big part of our children's day. But in other types of schools, it might not be as it might not be high on the priority list. Right. So um, I think that you know I would definitely recommend if there's anybody who is unsure that they contact Work CPAC to to advocate or help them to advocate for what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, absolutely, and, and that's a great point that you bring up, Kalina. I do want to add to that in hopes that Elizabeth can give us some insights. Uh, you know, one of the areas of challenge that we constantly get feedback about from parents around the district is the fact that while students have been given access to learning materials, either by receiving a packet or receiving that packet online, uh, they were not necessarily receiving instruction, uh, live or otherwise, Absolutely. from the teachers. So how is it that we can relate that to the re rendering of services or the lack thereof so that parents can begin to push for that, ask for that, and advocate for it together with CPAC to make sure that that changes because should that be viewed as delivery of services? Um, I mean, that, that's a great point. You know, I, I don't think if you're not getting any instruction, I don't, I don't see how that constitutes FAPE, a free appropriate public education for a student with, with disability. I mean, it's really an area where, where I think the state needs to provide more guidance because it, there's a lot of variation um, around the state. And I talked to a parent, it was a, a colleague from an um, affluent district whose child is not getting instruction in, in that district. I mean, it's not, it, I, don't, I don't think it's unique to Newark, um, but it's certainly, um, you know, especially as this goes on um, longer and longer, you know, districts need to figure out a way to get to get that instruction um you know have a virtual classroom uh, i mean is that happening at all in newark do you know or well i mean i i think that i think you've sparked some you know we have Sheila montague yolanda there are advocates on the call right now who are startled by that 40 percent number 40 percent of young people haven't logged on virtually so we do need to fact check that many of us are part of organizations who um, have spent many years championing, championing for students in North, and so we should be looking into that. Um, so that 40% is something we need to look at. I, I would assume that there are, most schools are offering at least in some way virtual class um, options, but we just don't know if all young people or if the majority of young people are able to utilize it. Mm -hmm. So I think we have some work to do at the local level. My son, um, what we're talking about now is not just Newark, it is a statewide conversation and my son attends a school for children with disabilities in Jersey City. It is a public school. And um, you know, it, we had a month where they weren't in school at the beginning of the year because of failures in school construction. And so he's already been displaced for about five weeks mm -hmm. early in the school year. He got, they got off to a late start and now this is happening. And so I think what stands with me the most is that for some of our children, even when they were in school or could have been in school, they were not receiving the proper educational experience. And now this is just magnifying that. So we have some work to do. Elizabeth, thank you for breaking things down for us. 
Um, you're not going anywhere, right? You're still going to yes, be. No, you're you're very welcome. And you know, I I had um, a, a couple of um, contacts, contact information. For yes. Assistance with special ed dispute that that hopefully you can send out to people. Um, yeah, and we, and we have that slide we're going to put up right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, that, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we are um, jotting down questions, so we're you know we're not going anywhere. Once we talk to our last guest, there may be a couple of questions we have time for. So, folks, if you have questions, just type them in, and we will get to them as soon as we can. We're multitasking here, so bear with us. Mm -hmm. um, so, thank you, Elizabeth. We're going to leave that slide up for a little bit. Hang on in the waiting okay. room, and we're going to bring up Nicole. Can you tell me how to pronounce Nicole's last name? Nicole Cuello is what I want to say. Um, I should have asked before. Nicole, hi. We can't hear you. Oh. Yeah. Uh, how you doing, Nicole? I'm good. How are you? And how do you pronounce your last name? Chulo. Chulo. Okay, I was wrong. <laughs> Nicole Chulo is here with us. She is the fundraising and events manager at the Education Law Center. And they are galvanizing the voices of parents as they transition to remote learning. There is a survey that the Edu Education Law Center has sent out. And Nicole is not only going to tell us about that survey, but she's going to share some of the preliminary data from that survey. So in terms of our call to action, guys, this is our next step for the parents who are on the call. So Nicole, please tell us about the uh, remote learning survey, what you found so far, and what you'd like us to do. Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation to join your Parent Power Hour today. Um, so Education Law Center prepared this survey to help gather some information about the main problems that students are experiencing related to school closure. This is not a scientific survey, um, but it has been helpful in getting a sense of what's going on around the state and just kind of identifying patterns in the experiences of New Jersey school children. Okay. Um, so I'm actually going to ask for Israel's help a little bit to go through some charts that we have. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to go with the first one, if you can pull that up. All right. So yeah, you're going to have to give us the name of the chart. I think it was just chart one. Oh, chart one. Thank, thank you. <laughs> okay. So we're going to let the chart fill up the screen so people can see it. Maybe just Nicole in the chart. Or just the chart. Whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Um, so as of this morning, there's been 325 responses to our survey. Um, of that, the majority of respondents have been parents or guardians, um, about 81%. 8% of respondents have been educators, and 6% have been students themselves. And then there were just a couple other groups that we threw in there, advocates and other. Um, Israel, if you can please switch to the next slide. Which is um, it is the one of the counties. Okay, um, so this chart kind of shows the breakdown of the counties where people have lived. There have been respondents all over the state, nothing particularly sticks out, but Cape May, Cumberland, and Salem counties are the only ones not represented in results. Um, yeah, and then the next one is going to be the type of school, if you can pull that up. Okay, so there has been variation in the type of school that respondents have attended, and the largest percentages have been from elementary schools or high schools. And preschool, as you can see by this chart, is the least represented in the survey results. Um, so this is just kind of some background information about who has been participating, but the main focus of the survey was to get at the concerns and issues being experienced by students and parents. So that's kind of where we're going to spend the most of our time um, discussing these results. So if you can go to the last um, picture of the bar chart. The bar chart. Bar chart. Yes, the bar chart of the topics um, of issues. There we go. Maybe you want us to fill the screen, maybe so it's a little easier. We can just put the chart up on the screen. Um, yeah, that would be great. So that way people can, can really easy, more easily read it. Yeah. All right. All right. Great. So this is where the bulk of our information has come from thus far. Um, we asked respondents to select the topic or the topics that best describe their issues 
And then they were offered the opportunity to provide more detailed explanations and an open-ended response field about what they're experiencing. About 50% of respondents reported issues with the delivery of special education and related services in IEP. And after reading through the written responses, the primary reason this option had been selected is due to the lack of modification of assignments. Other reasons include lack of speech or occupational therapy, not receiving the proper amount of speech or occupational um, therapy sessions per week, or parents having difficulty assisting with the provision of their student special education services. 42% of respondents selected regression of skills and about 38% selected absence of instruction, assignments, or communication as their issues. The comments show concern that remote learning is just not as effective as being in the classroom and that students are having difficulty learning new material, especially when packets are being provided rather than live instruction. Additionally, the results show that students are having difficulty focusing, are procrastinating on their work, and are feeling just a bit overwhelmed by the transition to remote learning in general. Um, about 30% of the respondents selected other as one of their issues, but most of the comments um, showed that this was related to the student workload being too high. So we then modified the survey to include that as an option as well. So yeah. a couple other things were mentioned, but let's keep other and student workload too high kind of as one topic. Wow. Um, then some just some other comments expressed concern over grading, including whether classes should be offered pass fail, regression of social skills due to lack of interaction or activities with peers, and parents having trouble assisting their students with assignments because they themselves don't understand the material. Absolutely. Um, and then the survey results also help to identify problems that maybe are not being widely experienced. So few respondents selected the absence of English um, language yeah, or bilingual yeah. services, high school graduation requirements, or access to school provided meals. Um, so that's all, you know, it's useful. Um, just information to know what's going on and what's not going on. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the last question on the survey kind of allowed respondents, it was open-ended again, the opportunity to show positive initiatives that their teachers, districts, or um, schools have implemented in response to school closure. So I do not have a chart for that one. Um, I did read through the comments and they mentioned successful provision of school breakfast and lunch through a grab and go method, um, successful dissemination of technology such as Chromebooks to those in need. And I think most prominent just that, you know, students and parents are so appreciative of the effort being put in by teachers. This is not an ideal situation by any means, but teachers are doing the best they can to provide an enriching educational experience. They're accessible and responsive. Um, and they're having a lot of communication, checking in on their students, offering one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings, sending videos to maintain and encourage social interaction, and developing and organizing effective online websites to ensure that students are able to keep up with their work and have some sort of normalcy during this yeah. very yeah. unnormal time. Yeah, I, I think um, Bridget Souza, I hope I said your name right, Bridget. Bridget said that we can't really call this remote learning because that's not really what's, what's happening. Um, Love said something about homeschool, but in my opinion, it's really not homeschooling because I think that's something that people agree to. But her comment was more, why aren't we using that model? Um, but Bridget said that this is really a never before seen concept. Mm -hmm. and I think that's great that you guys are doing this survey because you know now we've seen it and at some point, we need to name it. And she wanted to know, I don't know if any of us have an answer to this question, but Bridget wanted to know, how would you name this paradigm? Like, what is this? If it's not really remote learning, it's not really um, homeschooling, what is it? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think at this point, it's just kind of never been experienced. And it's just yeah. trial and error of doing the best that we can with the yeah. short notice and resources that we have. And obviously, there's going to be some hiccups along the way, but everyone can just yeah, do the best yeah. they can and we need to you know kind of celebrate those small victories and just appreciate that people are adapting and keep right. an open mind right. it's, it's education yeah. in the middle of a pandemic you know that's what it is it is very unnatural and it, it i think bridget is very right um, i have another question from uh rael and foreman who's an educator she says and i think this is some advice for educators um what happens if a parent and i don't know if you can answer this but maybe just give some advice what happens if a parent refuses services remotely? Like what should 
Um, and actually this might be, um, Nicole, you can try it or maybe even uh, Elizabeth, you know, what should an educator do if a parent refuses remote services? I believe this is for special needs children. Um, have um, you read that in any of your surveys that parents were refusing anything? No, I haven't read that actually in any of the comments, but I would punt this question over to Liz if we could bring her in to respond. Come on in, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> we're working on it and still trying to, to get the questions. Thank you, guys. Um, so Liz, Elizabeth, yeah. what, what should educators do if a parent refuses remote special education services? Um, I don't know that I have a clear cut answer. As a, as a general matter, if a parent uh, declines special education services, then they can no longer claim that they were denied a free appropriate public education. Mm -hmm. um, if I, I suppose it depends if the issue here is um, you know what, whether whether um, there's there's a way to. I mean, the, the issue may be the appropriateness of the services that are being mm -hmm. offered. So, um, you know, it, are there alternative means? If you know, I guess you need to investigate what what is the source of the parents' issue, and and is there another way that the services can be delivered? Right. Um, but you know, if if a parent just is is not in a position where where um, they can accept services because of whatever's going on, you know, the, the experiencing crises. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Um. Yeah. That's, another, <laughs> that's another issue. Yeah. Um, and so uh, Sheila Matsu asks, who has been surveyed? I know one of the reasons why I wanted us to have this conversation is because I'm hoping that our education advocates um, that are on this call will help us to make sure that North parent voices are included and maybe not just those who are internet savvy or, or you know, survey savvy, but maybe some of us can actually call some parents and, and have their voices represented. So I'm hoping that's what comes out of this. But Nicole, so far those 300 and something voices that you've heard from, where are those parents from? Okay, so, you know, the survey has been distributed on ELC's social media pages. Um, so you can find our Facebook page by searching for Education Law Center um, and our handle on Twitter. It's also there. It's at Ed Law Center. Um, so the people surveyed, you know, this, as I mentioned, it's not a scientific survey. Um, we've just posted it and people can choose to respond or not. It's kind of more like a convenience sort of thing. Um, if you're interested in responding, we'd love to hear from you. So we're going to encourage individuals to not only respond, but to share the survey with their peers, their colleagues and their friends on Facebook, Twitter, email, and any other means that you can think of. We've had some other advocacy organizations share to their networks, um, distribute to their list. And I know you had mentioned that you were happy to do so as well. Yes. And we would love to hear from them. We'll post it in the comments. Um, I'm sorry, there's an echo, guys. But we're gonna post it in the comments. And we're gonna send it out to our list to make sure that folks have it and encourage people to respond because nothing ELC does is for naught so we want to make sure that we provide our insight as well. Yeah, um, we, or, oh, sorry. Yeah, and I just want to mention um, with North CPAC, we'll gladly share with our network as well. Uh, as you know, um, Colleen and I will share it broadly because we want to inform decisions around education. Uh, I do want to mention really briefly and, and add to the question. Uh, one of the listeners um, mentioned that you know, there needs to be a name given to this time period uh, and to which we answered and said learning during a pandemic. Uh, research that's evolving, of course, because we're still in the middle of this pandemic, uh, but it's beginning to suggest that this period of time is very traumatic. Uh, so for many students, uh, especially those who are most vulnerable, they're experiencing traumas now like they haven't before. And so our response as we begin to normalize things will need to be from that perspective. Uh, so I'm just wondering if perhaps this is you, Nicole, Stan, or Elizabeth, um, how it is that you think we can lead the charge in response to that to really advocate for supportive services to help students navigate through this trauma? I think this is probably another question for Liz. <laughs> <laughs> Move on in, Liz. <laughs> I, I was actually hoping you could bring Stan in. <laughs> All right. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to to try, but I, I, you know, he's he's an educator, so I, I 
think his words are going to be more valuable than mine. Okay, let's bring in Stan. Nicole, <laughs> put you on hold, okay? Sounds perfect. Okay, so, um, so before before you go, Nicole, um, we would, you know, as as uh, information seekers, we do want to know um, in turn as we analyze the responses that ELC got on that survey, we would like to have an understanding of of what demographic of people it represents so far. Are you guys collecting demographic information on that survey or not? So the survey is not collecting demographic information at this point. Um, but I guess the last thing I would want to mention about the survey is just kind of what we're collecting the results for. Okay. Um, okay. So I think that's important to know too. Yes. Um, so Education Law Center offers individual advice and referrals through our intake system, but the results from this survey are just are more so to help inform our state level advocacy efforts moving forward by providing the broader understanding of what's being experienced. Um, we do have limited capacity, so we wanna make sure that our efforts and our energy and our resources are being used to address the most pressing needs of the parents and the students across the state. Yeah, and ELC has <laughs> whole existence, um, represented children in cities like Nort. You guys really are, you know, you the reason we have Abbott funding, the reason we have school construction, the reason we have a lot of things. So we trust you. And uh, we're going to do our part. So we're going to make sure that Nort voices are represented. So thank you so much, Nicole, for your work. And Stan, I'm not sure if you heard that question um, that came up before. We're going to uh, probably have to double back because um, Elizabeth thought it was a, a better question for you. I did um, hear the question, oh, actually, okay. uh, Kalina. Liz and I have actually had conversations about this because uh, I think, you know, I guess my answer would be that we need a lot of kinds of different kinds of advocacy at this point. We definitely need advocacy on the side of, you know, rights, resources, equity at the state level, at the policy level. But in terms of delivering, in terms of Safir's question and the, the importance of delivering um, services to families and students right now, I think we have to center um, uh, trauma-informed practices that take yeah. into account uh, what students are going through, the losses and uh, the trauma that families are facing. I think we need to make sure we have restorative practices, healing practices. I think educators, especially starting to think about, you know, between now and the time school reopens, are going to need some help in, in both preparing and delivering. And we can't just have a focus on delivering instruction or recreating uh, school uh, at home. Um, right. It's got to be a, a broad and, and uh, everybody's going to need uh, a lot of support to deliver the services that people need from a public education right now. Yeah. Thank um, you for that. Yeah. So Safia, do you have any other closing questions? We're still looking at the comments. Um, the questions that I can see have now uh, stopped. We want to start to wrap up because we're so grateful for Stan, Elizabeth, and Nicole's time. Is there anything that you would like to say um, in closing? I do have one, one final question, um, but I want to hand it over to Safia first. Uh, well, really, as it stands now, I mean, I think Stan really touched on really what I wanted to explore uh, around our response to the traumas that students are facing, um, yeah. especially those most vulnerable who are receiving special education services due to uh, sometimes some significant disabilities. Uh, so that was a great answer. I, I think incorporated in that, we do need to have mental health services. Uh, I think we need to expand that and broaden it in general uh, within our education system. Uh, Emily Peacock, thank you, Emily. She just said the same thing oh, in our comments. Yep, right. Emily Peacock, yes. Very nice. But uh, I, I think really the only question that remains is where we go from here. Uh, I do think, again, that ELC shines the light on the needs that exist, but they also take action to addressing those. So how can I help you further this along? How can we all partner and get this done? We're here, uh, and we certainly are willing to join in your efforts as I'm sure others are who are watching the broadcast. Yeah, and, and, that, and that leads right into my final question. It was from Denise Cole, which I thought was a really great uh, question to lead us into what to do next. She wants to know, because you know, Denise Cole is, a, is an avid school board uh, meeting attendee, and she wants to know that for parent leaders and for advocates in the community, when we go back to school and we have our first board meeting, 
or we have our first um, letter to the board, to the school board. School board elections, guys, mail-in ballots, May 12th, a reminder of that. Um, what should parents and advocates be asking of the district at the end of all of this? What is it that we should want to know? And that's for Stan or Elizabeth or Nicole, you know, they want some insight is, is what kind of information even now should we be asking for? I think one thing was, you know, the percentage of students who are logging into remote learning, that was important. Um, the student, the number of students who are actually utilizing remote special education services, we should wanna know that data. Um, if there's actually a remote learning plan, we should wanna know that. Uh, what else should we be asking for? Well, two things that come to mind, I don't think it's the whole range of, of concerns that need to give that a lot more thought, but uh, one concern is, you know, we're really concerned at ELC that schools are gonna need more resources. Mm -hmm. And what happened the last time that there was a, a huge meltdown during the financial crisis, schools were cut. And schools took almost a decade to recover from that. Wow. Um, New Jersey wasn't as bad as some, and there was, uh, you know, advocacy around that. So the budget process has been delayed. Um, we really need to look at what happens in the budget process to support uh, the kinds of education mm -hmm. services we need. And the second thing I'd mention is uh, I'm hearing that uh, Senator Ruiz and the state legislature are talking about forming a task force yeah. around uh, uh, education in the time of uh, COVID-19. And I think it's really important for advocates to engage that task force and let them know what their families and districts need. That's great. Thank you, Stan. All right. So we're going to um, bring up uh, um, Nicole or Elizabeth, have at least four of us in the screen because we can do that <laughs> as we um, wrap up today. But thank you to the Education Law Center for being with us today. Thank you for providing so much information. We're going to, in the comments section, put all of the links and different information that is relative to our conversation. And just like ALI classes are, this is a place where we gather information. And those of us who are leaders, we now have to take that information and activate it. So, you know, guys, thank you so much for those who ask questions. I hope that that question sparks some energy. And we are going to uh, thank Merck CPAC for co-hosting with us today. And um, go back to Monday when spring break is over for my son as well. And this remote learning re-begins. I just hope that all of us parents just rely on one another, um, be patient and kind with one another. You know, there have been some days where I've been about this close to snapping. So I think we all should just pray for each other and be very careful how we um, we deal with each other because this is a lot right now. So I pray and hope that all of your families are safe and we're going to cue our goodbye music. I'm hoping that it's kind of ready maybe to go. <laughs> it's not. So, oh, okay, well, here we go, maybe. All right. <laughs> Thank you Thank guys you. so much and enjoy. Have a good weekend. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Kalina. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, everyone. Uh, you can put up the slide Elizabeth had with the um, contact for services. We'll put that slide back up as we go out. I'm going to wake up.